Over the past seven months, the Kaiser Family Foundation has been surveying many Americans from all walks of life. The goal of this survey was to look at attitudes towards vaccines dating all the way back to August 2020. On Friday, February 26th, they released their latest update. How do different demographic variables impact attitudes towards the vaccine? How have attitudes changed over the last seven months? And what do the results mean for us going forward? That's what we're gonna get into on today's Taste of Medicine. So if you've read any news articles or listened to any broadcast talking about how different groups within the United States view uh, the vaccine, it has undoubtedly been referencing the Kaiser Family Foundation survey data. The KFF has released three updates to the survey. Within each survey, there have been between 17 and 1800 respondents. They start by asking each person what their likelihood of getting the vaccine is whether they've already been vaccinated, whether they're gonna get it as soon as possible, wait and see, only if required, or definitely not get it. They then ask about the person themselves. What's your race, your age, your level of education, where do you live, and your political affiliation, to name a couple. So we're just gonna go through these figures one at a time and just kind of look at what the trends are within these different subsets of groups and then also how those attitudes have changed over the last seven months. Let's go. I should also mention now that the kids are back in school, I can actually film during the day and don't have to wait until after bedtime. So it's gonna be brighter here and I'll likely be louder. Don't wait kids for a YouTube video. Spouses do not look kindly upon that. So for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna break the responses into the following groups. One, I already got it or I'm gonna get it ASAP. That's gonna be in the dark blue. Two, uh, I'm gonna kinda see how things go. That's gonna be in the light blue. And then the final group is either only gonna get it if they absolutely have to or under no circumstances do they plan on getting it. And those are gonna be in the green. So here in figure one, we see kind of what the responses have been over the last couple of months. The first vaccine to get authorization in the United States was the Pfizer vaccine, and that didn't happen until mid end of December. So in the December responses, no one had been vaccinated as of yet. So when I look at this graph, what I think it's telling us is that those who don't want to get the vaccine has largely stayed stable, and that more and more of those who are taking a wait and see approach are falling into the camp of planning to get it as soon as they're able. All right, and the next table we're looking at vaccine enthusiasm. <laughs> My kids definitely don't have that. Um, across racial and ethnic groups. So the three groups that we have to look at are white, Hispanic, and black. So for the white adults who were surveyed, those who had not planned to get vaccinated back in December are really haven't changed their mind. The people who are changing their mind are more the wait and see. They are becoming more and more likely to plan to get the vaccine as soon as it's available. So within the Hispanic subset of adults, we see that the people who plan to get it as soon as it's available to them has doubled, going from 26% to over 50%. Again, the majority of this is likely coming from the wait and see folks, as there's been a little bit of headway amongst those who don't want to get the vaccine or don't plan to, but not much. And this is very similar for the black adult group, with the number of people who plan to get it as soon as it's available to them doubling from 20 to 41%. But again, the vast majority of that group is coming from the wait and see. Not a lot of headway on the hard nose or only if required group as of yet. For political affiliation, we see a similar trend across all three groups, Democrat, Independent, and Republican. For the Democrat, we started at about 50% planning to get the vaccine as soon as it was available to them, and that's increased to 75% of respondents. And that those increases are from people who were originally in the wait and see camp switching over to the planning to get it. Comparing that to people who identified as Republican, somewhere between a quarter and a third of those Republicans planned to get the vaccine as soon as they could. 
but that's only increased to 40%, so still pretty low. And we see that the percent of people who definitely don't plan to get the vaccine has again stayed the same, but instead of being a couple of percent is uh, 28%. So more than one in four of those who identified as Republican are not planning to get the vaccine. Figure five goes over a whole host of things, but I think the most pertinent here is when it comes to age. So this is looking at, again, the people who either have already been vaccinated or who are gonna get it ASAP. And the most likely group to say yes is those who are aged 65 and older. And this makes sense because they're the highest risk for not surviving getting infected. Figure eight looks at differences in vaccine enthusiasm kind of a weird term, between black and white and Hispanic adults uh, controlling for education. So what this is saying in the top, we're looking at adults in those three different ethnic groups uh, who do not have a college degree, and in the bottom, looking at those three different groups who do have a college degree. So there's kind of two things that jump out at me at this figure, right? The first is that black adults are most likely to be vaccine hesitant. And that's kind of irrespective of whether they have a college degree or not. And white adults without a college degree are the most likely to say definitively not interested in the vaccine. But then when comparing that to figure nine, and you see that black adults over 65 are the most likely to accept the vaccine, and that black adults 18 to 49 are really the subset of group that is most likely to say no or the, or the most likely to take a wait and see approach. And I guess one takeaway is, well, at least the people who are at highest risk are the most likely to get the vaccine. Our big challenge is taking those in the wait and see approach and giving them enough comfort to get them into, hey, I wanna get it as soon as I can, while also hopefully taking some of those who are in that only if required or definitely not and just nudging them into the more of the wait and see. And figure 11 covers that. And probably one of the most important aspects we can do to kind of help nudge people in the direction to getting the vaccine is having them know someone who's getting the vaccine. Anecdotal evidence is really important to most people. It's hard for us to make sense of huge data sets of tens or hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people but if your mom, your dad, your brother, your husband, your wife got the vaccine and they did okay, that has a really important psychological impact on you to say, oh, well, I know Mary got it and so I feel really comfortable getting it. Living with someone who got the vaccine makes you twice as likely to be wanting to get it as soon as you can. And not knowing someone who got the vaccine yet makes it twice as likely that you're gonna say no. Another question they asked the participants was, if you haven't gotten the vaccine yet, what are you worried about? And I would say there are a couple of things that are worth worrying about and are real barriers or concerns for people. And then some are just clearly due to misinformation or misunderstanding of the science. So one of the biggest differences between people who are planning to get it as soon as possible compared to those who are wait and see or only if required or definitely not was the thought that they would be able to get COVID from the vaccine itself. So again, both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine are mRNA vaccines and only code for the spike protein, which is only one small component of the virus as a whole. So there's no possible way to get COVID from the mRNA vaccines. But there are definitely legitimate concerns about it. So one is that you're gonna feel kind of crappy for a day or two and might have to miss work. That's real. I mean, definitely docs and residents that I know had to call in sick the next day if they were scheduled to, to, to work. Traveling to be able to participate, that's an important problem for a lot of people, right? If you live in a very rural area and it takes you hours to drive there, or if you live in a city but don't have access to reliable transportation, that is a hard challenge to overcome. And I think that gets into one of the other things that people raise is, I want to get the vaccine in a place I trust, right? And this is where outreach becomes really important. Doing it in community centers, doing it in churches, doing it in schools, this shouldn't just be done in the clinic or hospital setting. 
anything we can do to make this experience more um, comforting to those participating, we should be all for. And relating to kind of mistrust in the system or in science, that half of black adults and a third of Hispanic adults had concerns that it wasn't studied effectively in their ethnic or racial group. Now this gets to a very good scientific question that we've talked about before on this, which is generalizability. If you study something in a small population, well, is that going to hold true for other groups, whether it's age, sex, ethnicity, race, whatever? That's an important question to answer. So just taking the United States as a whole, about a little over 12% of our population is black and over 18% of our population is Hispanic. So ideally what you'd like to see is that those ethnic racial groups make up an equivalent amount of the study groups that were done in the Pfizer and Moderna studies. In the Moderna study, 20% of the participants identified as Hispanic and 10% as either black or African. In Pfizer's study, 28% of the participants identified as Hispanic. The big reason for that is one of the main clinical sites they studied was in Argentina and 9% identified as either black or African. So in both groups, Hispanics were represented at least as much as they make up of the general population and black and African participants were slightly less, but pretty close to the 12% rate. All right, so what are the takeaways from everything we've talked about? Number one, change is hard for people to accept. And this isn't just specific to vaccines. This goes in all walks of life. And there is going to be a natural progression that over time, as people are more used to it, more comfortable with it, they will be more accepting of it. A lot of the critiques I've heard are coming from an emotional place that people just feel like it's too soon. They don't feel like it's safe enough but they're not really going to the primary literature and critiquing the study design or, or the you know, biostatistical analysis methodology. It, they just don't feel comfortable yet. And no amount of data is gonna change that. It's just gonna take time and familiarity with other people who have taken the plunge, which is what we've seen in this. That thus far, the headway we've made has largely been from those people who are in the wait and see basket and then decided to say, oh, well, with everything I'm seeing, uh, I'm gonna get this vaccine as soon as I can. But we really haven't made much headway in those people who are only gonna get it if it's absolutely required or definitely don't plan to get it. Knowing someone who's gone through this process is probably the most important aspect to changing people's attitudes towards accepting it. All right, that's gonna do it for this episode. Thanks for joining me. Like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I gotta invoke my seven-year-old. And I'll see you next time on A Taste of Medicine.